In these videos, we'll be looking at evolutionary psychology. And so when we think about evolutionary psychology, we think about how human evolution has selected for a disposition towards certain behaviors that increase the fitness of individuals with them. So thinking back to um, from early parts of the course, variation, selection, and heritability led to evolution. So the variation we're thinking about is a population of people that has individuals who exhibit behaviors A and behaviors B. So some do each of these behaviors or have a propensity to do each of those behaviors. The selection will arise from behavior A tending to lead to higher fitness than behavior B. So they'll do better than them. And heritability arises from there being at least some genetic influence on the likelihood that an individual is disposed towards A or B. Right? So we're not necessarily thinking about black and white traits where individuals will always do behavior A or always do behavior B. It can be more subtle where there's a genetic influence that makes a particular individual more likely to do behavior A than behavior B. That would still be selected if doing behavior A resulted in a better outcome more than doing behavior B. And so if these three things are going on, then the alleles that increase the likelihood of behavior A would increase in frequency. And then over time, that behavior would go from being an example of a variant within a population to being the wild type behavior where now everybody in the population has an increased propensity towards behavior A instead of B. Now again, we could end, that could end up with a population of having behaviors A and B, but the population has evolved to have a state in which it will do behavior A more than behavior B, whereas maybe in the past they did both of them equally or something like this. So unlike clear, discrete traits, which is maybe what we think about with like pandas, thumbs, and things like that, it's a little more subtle. It's having different likelihoods of doing different behaviors. So we thought about this a little bit earlier in the course. Uh, we had a section in the sexual selection part of the course where I warned about the dangers of evolutionary psychology, right? So to briefly recap, it's very easy to look at something like this and think about, oh, this person's attractive or this person's attractive and we're attracted to people like this because they are thin and healthy or we're attracted to people like this because they are obviously in good shape to be able to put on fat and are pale because they haven't been exposed to the sun. But how to distinguish between things that we might think have advantages, like preferring different types of partners or being afraid of certain types of organisms, how to distinguish that from cultural factors was difficult, so we needed a more scientific approach. And as I mentioned then, the best tests are experiments with unconscious decisions that removes um, conscious thinking and cultural biases, or comparisons that are uh, universal across all sorts of different cultures. So this is what we talked about a little bit earlier in the course, and this was presented as a cautionary tale, and um, you should be very cautious um, when you're presented with evolutionary psychology studies. Now we'll actually look at evolutionary psychology in a little bit more detail. So if we're gonna think about fitness for humans, we wanna think about fitness components. So for humans, we have survival, reproduction, and offspring rearing. So survival and reproduction are just like with other organisms, behaviors that improve mortality and health would be favored behaviors that increase the chance of acquiring mates are favored. For humans, we're kind of unusual because since we have so much child care, right, human offspring require so much care and human resources are usually limited, right? so this limits the maximum number of offspring that most individuals can have in terms of humans compared to maybe other animals. Behaviors that favor the survival and quality of offspring are then favored. And so with humans, we definitely want to be thinking about how fitness is often best measured um, via the number of grandchildren that are able to be produced. So this is a third factor that is more important for humans than perhaps for a lot of other animals because there can be such differences in the quality of offspring produced by the childcare because childcare is so extensive. So think about these three things, survival, reproduction, and offspring care. As we develop some hypotheses and think about these things, we want to keep these three things in mind, and we want to keep these three things in mind as well. First of all, most of human evolution occurred in a much less modern or technological society, 
So if we're thinking about whether a certain behavior would be advantageous or, or not, it doesn't make any sense to think about whether it's advantageous in modern society. It makes a lot more sense to think about whether it would have been advantageous in society 100,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, a million years ago, that sort of technology, that sort of social structure. So we want to make sure also to think about how a behavior in those contexts, right, so keep in mind the contexts are very, very different, how would a behavior in those contexts translate into a fitness difference between the behavior and alternatives? And this is important because a lot of people, when they think about evolutionary psychology, they think about things like what would make individuals happier or what would make individuals uh, more respected or something like that or nicer. But nicer or happier aren't going to be selected for unless they translate into increased number of offspring and grandchildren. So we always need to relate these behaviors we'll be thinking about into fitness differences. And then third, if we have a hypothesis, again, we want to do good science, we want to take this hypothesis and make predictions that we can then test in order to test our hypothesis. So we need to make sure we do these things, keep the context in mind, make sure that any behavior we're thinking about translates into fitness differences, and then use this hypothesis to make predictions so that we can test it. If we think about context examples, so most of human history, humans live in very small social groups with lots of relatives nearby, so maybe dealing with relatives is important. Back in the day, there was very little formal centralized authority, right? There was no such thing as the police until just a few hundred years ago. And, but there was high amounts of informal, decentralized social bonding, right? So a person's reputation was important. And gossip was something that got around a lot and determined a person's reputation in ways that were much, much more influential back then than they are, say, today, right? Today, if you get a bad reputation, you could just move to somewhere where nobody knows you, right? Well, back then, nobody was ever able to move to a place where everybody didn't know them from when they were a small child. That's a very different context. Historically, there would have been, for most groups, very little contact with out-group individuals. So when a group of individuals encountered strangers, those interactions would have often been confusing because they spoke a different language, or aggressive or violent because confusion leads to violence and conflict. And of course, for most of human history, an understanding of genetic versus communicable diseases was absent, right? If an individual was sick or ill, you would not have known whether it was a genetic disorder or some sort of disease that they could give you. So that lack of an understanding of the difference can translate into different strategies. Essentially, if you see someone that appears to have a problem, maybe it's best off assuming that it's a communicable disease or acting as if it is, even if maybe that makes, means you make a mistake and sometimes you minimize your contact with people with genetic disorders that you wouldn't be able to catch. And there are a number of other things that come up as we think about each scenario. It's always important to keep the different context within which humans evolved in your mind. And the other thing to remember is that choices and mistakes can have serious consequences. Right, so today if we think about the society that we live in, we generally don't die before we reproduce. We can make lots of mistakes, and they very rarely have serious, life-threatening consequences. But back in human history, mistakes could lead to death much more easily than they do today. So in fact, the consequences of mistakes or errors were much more dramatic back then than they would be today, and we need to keep this in mind. And this actually leads to a principle we'll talk about called the smoke detector principle. So let's think about the consequences of certain types of mistakes. So uh, back when you took biostats, you learned about type 1 error, which is when the null hypothesis is true, but you reject it. Type 2 error is when the null hypothesis is false, but you accept it. Some errors are worse than others, especially when survival is involved. So for example, not fearing a dangerous animal is a worse mistake than fearing a harmless one. Right? If you think about that, those are both mistakes. You could both translate these into null and alternative hypotheses, type 1, type 2 errors, but one of these mistakes is clearly worse than the other. Right? So if an animal is dangerous and you're not afraid of it, 
then you'll get killed. If an animal is harmless and you are afraid of it, then you've just inconvenienced yourself. Or not staying away from a sick person is much, much worse than avoiding a healthy one. So if a person is sick and you don't stay away from them, you'll catch their disease and maybe you'll die. On the other hand, maybe an individual looks like they're sick, but they're actually healthy. Well, avoiding them is not a big deal, right? You've inconvenienced yourself, maybe you've made them feel sad, but it's not the same sort of magnitude as catching a disease. So given that some consequences are worse than others, and if you look at these two examples, the kind of the fearful one and the avoiding one, those are the better choices, even though they are mistakes, than the kind of more brave or accepting choices. So this leads to uh, this principle, the smoke detector principle. It is better to be overly cautious instead of overly daring. And it gets its name from smoke detectors in apartments are calibrated to go off at the slightest amount of smoke. Because, of course, you would much rather have a smoke detector that gives you 10 false alarms but guarantees that it goes off when there's an actual fire that maybe you have a smoke detector that never makes false alarms but it will take longer to go off when a fire does start. So it's better in general to be overly cautious instead of overly daring. And so we can make this argument. And so one of the kind of ways in which we can see this principle at work is if there are mismatches between the perception and reality, right? So this whole thing here is based on fearing or not fearing either dangerous or harmless animals. If the smoke detector principle is at play, you might expect us to kind of be fearful more than we should, right? Fear harmless animals more than we are accepting of dangerous animals. And in fact, maybe our perception to be completely off where we perceive animals to be dangerous much more than they are because they'll result in more successful behaviors. So this is in fact an interesting book written about how we're actually hardwired to be fearful of many things and if other individuals figure that out, they can figure out how to manipulate you based on your fear. So some fear is conscious, right? We can think about actual threats and how common they may or may not be. Mismatches between what we feel and what we have evidence for are indicative of our brain using this sort of smoke detector principle.